this is where August Wacker was found, uh, April of 2005. Uh, I ha happened to be the on-call detective at the time. Uh, called me and said they had a black male that was located off of Highway 90. Well, I'm thinking it's off of Highway 90, not down this little side road right here. When I get here, August Watkins laying face down right here on the ground. Uh, he was located by some people. Uh, I don't recall their names right now, but they were looking for a loved one who was missing. And they were checking all the side roads, and uh, they stumbled across August Watkins, who was dumped right here. And when we talked to the um, the detective, we went there, looked at the picture, and it was him. He was face down in the ditch on one of the pictures, swole up because the way they had him lean, he was lean, the head down in the ditch where all the blood probably rushed to his head, to the, you know, and swole him all up. And I was like, man, I can't really look at that at the time. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clementi, former New York City prosecutor and retired FBI profiler. And with me is... Laura Richards, criminal behavioral analyst, formerly of New Scotland Yard, an advocate and founder and director of Paladin, the National Stalking Advocacy Service, and also co-creator and producer of the case of Jean Benet Ramsey. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for Criminal Minds, where Jim Clementi is my colleague, and I have a real interest in real crime and these minds that solve those crimes. This is the third iteration, third podcast that we're doing on the Bayou killings. And if you haven't listened to the two prior ones, uh, you should probably go back and listen to them because they'll put this into context. But we're talking about the multiple victims, 23 known victims of a serial killer that we're only calling RD because we're not going to give that person the time of day, the time on this podcast to basically promote even his name uh, because he was such a prolific serial killer. And unfortunately, there are at least 23 young men who lost their lives because of that one person who didn't give a damn about other human beings. And if you'd like to see their faces, you can go to our Facebook page where there are thumbnails of the known victims of this killer, um, and you can look at each and every one of them. And of course, there are probably many more who were either near misses or victimized by this particular individual. And, you know, serial killers, in terms of what they do, we only know really a, a fraction of it. So there are others who we know are out there too, and we want to honor them as well. Many people don't come forward when they've there's pre-cursory offenses, wh which don't ultimately end up in a murder. But he was that prolific that people don't just start with killing. So that's another important point to mention. And we'd like to just reiterate our call to our listeners. If you know any of these victims, uh, we would love to talk to you, to hear about them, to bring them back, to give the world an idea of who they were as people. Because to us, those victims deserve that voice, that the voice they lost at the hands of this monstrous killer. One of the other things that Real Crime Profile obviously want to do is honor people's lives and learn from their deaths, but also learn from other people who knew the victims better and they can color their lives for us. And the intervention and prevention part is also very important that we try and get in far earlier when there's a continuum of violence and abuse. And we can do much more to prevent these tragedies from happening. And towards that end, we are extremely lucky that after our last podcast, somebody out there who knew one of the victims of RD did come forward and does want to talk to us and tell us about his friend. Uh, the friend's name is Kurt Cunningham. And um, we are just so grateful that um, we've just finished a podcast with him and he's told us all about Kurt. And so we can't wait for you to hear that uh, coming up next on Real Crime Profile. The next victim that we have is Michael Vincent. And unfortunately, again, this is one of the victims that we simply do not have information about. So Michael Vincent uh, was a 20-year-old black male 
who was from, I think, Lafayette Parish. Uh, we don't have much more information about him, um, but he was a human being whose life was taken, and he deserves to have his voice given back to him. So if anybody out there in our listening audience knows more about Michael Vincent, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so now we move on to, we really have to group these three victims together because they're related. And I wanted to ask you guys how, how common that is in serial murders to have the victims be related to each other. I don't even know if the the killer knew that they were related, but the Trell Woods, August Watkins, and Wayne Smith, and Chris DeVille were all related. So that means Octavia Jones, who was um, their grandmother and aunt, you know, lost quite a few people in her family and and devastated, you know, f- many people in her family with these deaths. Well, I do think it's extremely rare that the victims, especially victims of opportunity like this for a serial killer, that they'd be related. You would think that under normal circumstances, if they had known that there was a serial killer around and if they had known that people that they were close to and related to became the victims of that serial killer, that it would be something that they would then have heightened um, uh, defenses up about. But it could also come back to the fact that I don't think there was a lot of publicity about anything that was going on at this time and that there was an actual serial killer involved in, in these deaths. And so I think that maybe uh, that was a huge disservice to the public because they couldn't um, actually protect themselves. They didn't know they had to protect themselves at the time. Of course, it could come down to, I guess, you know, proximity as well and geography. You know, are they, they're all related. Are they living in close proximity in this area as well? And is it within RD's hunting ground, within his anchor points in terms of where his um, trying to pick up his victims. So, you know, it could be much more to do with the the locality and where they're socializing and the proximity. They were all from Huma. I, I do I do read that. Uh, Detrell Woods was 18. Uh, he was found in a sugar cane field uh, in eastern Huma. And, Let's talk about that. Yeah. So he's an 18-year-old boy. I guess he's an 18-year-old young man at this point. He was found in 2004. Um discarded in, in the bush of a sugarcane field. Um, and he, so Detrell Woods, from his picture, looks like a child. He, he looks very young, and uh, this may be the last picture that was taken of him while he was alive. And again, he became the victim, but he was the first of uh, four family members related uh, that, that became the victim of this serial killer. The next victim was August Watkins, and he was found uh, later in 2005. Right, was, and, they, and they were cousins. Yeah, he was 31 years old. Um, he was out of Uma, um, and he was found in a ditch off of Route 90. He was found face down, wasn't he, by the side of a road in a ditch in La Fouche. And they could not find the cause of death for him. Um, But, you know, again, when you have a situation where you're in Louisiana um, and uh, with the humidity there, decomposition happens very quickly uh, as well as... um, you know, animal activity on victims. So it's it's very grim, just a horrible, horrible situation. Uh, and then we're going to move on to Wayne Smith. And, and this is somebody who we do have a lot of information about because his grandmother, if you guys watched the, um, the Bayou Serial Killer documentary, you know, she, she and her daughter and uh, other relatives are interviewed, you know, quite, extensively and um, they talk about him as being uh, a great kid he's in high school he has a girlfriend he's always coming home he's not somebody who disappears for days at a time you know very stable home and and when he went missing their whole family started looking for him 
Um, I don't know if the police took it as seriously as they did, but they definitely it, it was definitely a red flag and not something that he would normally not come home and not let people know where he was. And if you look at his picture, Wayne Smith, he, first of all, he was legally a child. He's 17. He was not an adult. Um, and so we, we have to also dial that into the profile. So this is now a child sex offender. Um, he's done, he, he's killed at least one person who is a child, and, and a lot of his other victims are barely into the age of adulthood. Um, but he, you look at his picture and you could see such life and light in him. And Yeah, the um, sweet boyish. He still has that boyishness to his face. And, and to know that that was taken away from him, that he was most likely raped and murdered um, the same way that these other victims were. And he was, you know, just a good kid from high school in a stable home. Um, He must have fallen victim because of some vulnerability that the serial killer took advantage of. Well, probably coming home from somewhere and unfortunately happens upon R.D., who he probably uh, seems to, you know, as as everybody else was, was fooled by him of of not presenting a threat. And I think it was after... um, Wayne Smith, wasn't it, that Hurricane Katrina hit. It was then the six to eight month storm recovery, which obviously then put another hiatus on this particular investigation. Right. And basically what you find is that at that time, many of the law enforcement offices were wiped out. Uh, They were damaged by floods and high winds. And much of the case materials and the evidence in these cases were destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. And so were the houses in the area. And so many of the people who lived in these neighborhoods had to move north away from where the storm damage was, those who survived the storm. And, and because of that, uh, there was a major shift in, in this uh, offender's hunting grounds. Wayne Smith was one of the last victims um, in the area uh, where, where Hurricane Katrina hit. Now, I will add a caveat. I remember when we analyzed this case in the Behavioral Analysis Unit that we looked at both Wayne Smith's case and the next case, which is Chris DeVille, who was found in September 2005. His brother was actually a police officer, and he was a, he was seen alive just before Hurricane Katrina hit. Um but because of other circumstances, we, we were actually able to tie this case into this serial killer series. But um, there were many, many, many people killed during Hurricane Katrina in this area. And there were many bodies recovered after days and some after weeks um, uh, of decomposition. So we believe that it's very likely that this killer actually killed a number of other victims and just hid their bodies as part of the Hurricane Katrina uh, disaster. This is something that um, was was quite a bonus to this particular offender. It allowed him to um, cover his tracks much better. Uh, obviously, he killed two people, two young men, well, one child and one young man, in a very, very short period of time. And, and he was able to then move on to another area where they weren't familiar with him. And it would be a short time before um, the, the law enforcement officers in that new area uh, up north would realize that they now had a serial killer in their midst. So I think we're we're going to go back to victim what we have on our list is victim 18 Nicholas Peregrine. We we also know a lot more about him because his mother and sister spoke out in the documentary I mentioned Mystery of the Bayou Killer and they did a lot more interviews with the media. There are a lot more pictures of them in the news. Um and does it strike you that this also is a is a jump in the serial killer's I don't know in his his style or his strategy because he was known to the victim and was seen with the victim, um, not as just an anonymous person, but by his name. I mean, 
he could be identified by name with this, with Nicholas. Yeah, I think it was a serious risk. And I think that part of that may be because uh, he was having trouble uh, relocating after the storm. Uh, it may have also been that that he had um, some extreme success because of Hur- Hurricane Katrina and uh, became even more emboldened than he had been before. Remember, now he's he's literally up to at least 18 victims. He's definitely in double digits. He's definitely gotten away with many of these murders and, and barely any media coverage on, on most of them. So I think he, uh, here's a man, this offender is a man who is a a now practice criminal who's got his M.O. down, who knows exactly what he has to do. He's got his shtick down where he gets close to the victims by playing this, you know, weak and vulnerable person and so afraid and so worried. And then once he gets them in a vulnerable position, he completely transforms to the person that he really is, the one that he's been hiding, this vicious serial killer, this sadistic man who knows how to manipulate other people into a vulnerable situation. But doesn't he stick out? This particular victim, I know the family for a really long time, didn't think that he was connected to the other killings because they thought that it was a drug deal gone bad, that he'd kind of been in and out of trouble and had some frenemies that were kind of always at war with each other. So they really thought that this was not... um, they certainly did not think it was a situation where he was a prostitute prostituting himself, and they didn't think it was a situation where he would go off with someone to have sex for money with a, a female. So, I mean, is it possible that it was some other, like, uh, that R.D. was able to overpower said, these guys mm-hmm. with, like, a drug or with something else that would... that would? No, I think that's a very convenient, uh, you know, um, sort of rationalization yeah. on the part of people who don't want to, you know, admit that maybe their loved one or somebody they knew was involved in things that they didn't know about. And, yeah. and well, just the fact that you're saying that they thought maybe it was a drug deal going bad, well, we know that this particular offender would approach people who were selling drugs and he would make propositions to them. And he may have said something and this guy may have impulsively, because he did actually know him, um, that, you know, and maybe uh, it was the fact that this guy was sort of new to this job and and that he um, he kind of could have looked up to this guy, that, that he just felt absolutely comfortable going off with him. It didn't necessarily mean that he had agreed to have sex with him or that he agreed to do something illegal with him, but on the other hand, it could have. We just have to keep open that possibility. I do know, though, from the string of 23 known murders and the potential of other murders, that this particular offender was very resourceful. He knew how to manipulate the situation so that he would not appear to be threatening. And who knows what he um, he actually, in you know, approached this particular victim with. But the fact is that, you know, Many human beings don't tell their families everything that they're into. Right. But just looking at Nicholas, he's as a big, strong construction worker guy. It's just so hard for me to believe that R.D., you know, this little nerdy marshmallow of a person could overpower him to that extent to, to bind him yeah, to that well, extent. They could have gotten uh, drunk together. Yeah, it okay. could have been something as simple as that. Uh, he might have drugged him, but there was no evidence, at least uncovered, in any of the cases of such a drug being used. But also, it could be that he he we know that at least in one of the cases in which he was arrested, um, that he had a big uh, buck knife that he would use threateningly to the victim. So he could have used that knife to control him. One of the things that we know about human nature, right, Laura, is that people are actually more easily controlled with a knife than with a gun Um, because people, many people, most people in the world have had some experience getting cut by a knife. They know how simply it can slice through your flesh. They have this visceral fear of it. And so so it could be that he controlled, controlled this particular victim and other victims with a knife. And it could also be that there was some other substance involved. 
I was just going to say, I thought that um, Nick Pellegrim, yes, he was a meter reader and uh, it was a high risk choice, but there was a suggestion as well that uh, around marijuana, wasn't there, that um, they were going to meet later and that RD was either going to supply it or they they were going to smoke it. But either way, he managed to arrange some form of meeting later on. Um, And I think, you know, a lot, as, as Jim C said, we don't know exactly uh, what went on, but whether RD uses his, you know, I'm sort of trying to survive, I'm the victim here and I don't want to be overpowered and say, will you do X um, and puts people in those positions. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. He certainly seems to have a way of understanding what people's sort of Achilles heel is um, or Achilles heel, you know, in each particular case where someone's got a vulnerability, he does seem to hone in on that and mm-hmm. gets people into these positions where he then persuades them. And I think a lot of it is to do with his demeanor and the way that he comes across that he's not really a threat and therefore he can do to them what, what he wants to after he's got them restrained and when he's got the power and control. And we have seen him in the past use knives, as Jim said, and a gun in the 1993 offence. So he will use things when, when he needs to. And that's, that's what offenders and those who get away with it do. And when we come back, we'll talk about the next victim, Kurt Cunningham. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I even had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. They found him on the night. He died that Saturday, the night that he left. That was the night he really got killed. That was for six. Okay? And then for the 19th, that's when Detective Dawn and the one from the Foose Paris, that other detective, I can't remember his name, but he was, he, I liked that. <laughs> I could tell you what, I did like that cop. But anyhow, He's the one that came, we met at my son's house, and they the one that came out and told us, yeah, they found the body, and it was my son. So the next victim is Kurt Cunningham, who was 23 years old, also of Uma. Uh, he was found, again, in, in one of these drainage canals, um, and about 50 feet away from a highway. This is another instance of just discarding the victim, and again, that is an indicator that that the offender doesn't have any known relationship to the victim. I know that at some point here, um, the uh, law enforcement task force um, had just had a big meeting um, about the case, and and as they were leaving the meeting, they they got a call that there was another body, and um, it just you know it just reminds me over and over and over again how inactive and not proactive um, this task force was. Uh, As Laura said, they should be out there. And you said, Lisa, they should be interviewing everybody. They should go back and interview everybody they possibly can in the victim circles. They should go back to victim one. They should talk to everybody because somewhere there is someone out there who knows that he crossed paths with who would eventually be identified as R.D., the, the killer in this case. And it's just good police work. It should have been done a lot earlier, and they should have known, even though you have people who are living high-risk lifestyles who hitchhiked or, or sold drugs or got involved in prostitution, just because of all those things doesn't mean that you still don't you know, really work the neighborhoods, really do canvases and try to find out what this person was doing. And 
how they were interacting that got them uh, killed. And Jim, at what point did the FBI come into this? Well, we came in. I, I know that one of the first cases that we studied was the case of Mitchell Johnson. Um, but we came in as as consultants for the local jurisdiction. And I have to say that it's one of the the darkest times of my experience in the BAU. Um, I was working in child crimes against children. And so at that point, all the victims were adults. So it was not uh, a case that came into my purview. And unfortunately, unlike um, the TV show Criminal Minds, where we get to just jump on a plane for every case, we were working hundreds of cases, um, hundreds of victims across the country in, in Crimes Against Children unit. And But I do remember uh, walking by one of the offices of one of my colleagues, and, um, and they were talking between themselves, and it happened to be about this case in New Orleans. And I remember a remark uh, from one of my colleagues about the victims being gay black guys. And that was not said with much respect. It was actually the the opposite. It was said with disrespect. And it really it really offended me. And it really um, made me think that, that even in the FBI, these victims were not getting a voice. It wasn't until months later, um, maybe many months later, that I was actually involved in a in a uh, consultation with this case because at least one of the victims then had been under the age of 18. But because the majority of these um, victims were over 18 and even into their 30s, um, and one of them might have been even 40, that the case remained in the Crimes Against Adult Unit and uh, it did not become a Crimes Against Children matter. But I do believe that um, on a number of occasions we gave um, consultation advice to the local law enforcement and the task force that had been put together. Um, I think post-Katrina, there was a whole new uh, effort made because we knew that, unfortunately, a lot of the case evidence had been destroyed. Fortunately, the DNA samples that had already been collected were in CODIS, so that's good. But we did not, um, we did not necessarily have all the evidence that was was originally collected, and we were very concerned that it was going to give this offender an opportunity to just walk away scot free. So, Jim, I really want to thank you for sharing that about your colleague who made that comment. That can't be an easy thing for you to disclose, and mm-hmm. and and I mean, what if the FBI is having this sort of attitude? Then you know. Of yeah. course, than the law enforcement underneath them, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, um, in fact, uh, using the term the FBI, um, it's Sorry, a yeah. person in Correct. the FBI. I but I do think that that it was more a reflection of how this case was presented to them by the local authorities. And that person just went along with it, which to me... Um, that's the time you need to step up and be an FBI agent and represent the FBI because you do represent the FBI and that person should have stood up and made it a point. And in fact, if they found that the local law enforcement officers and the task force were not actually addressing this case properly, they should have stood up and taken a leadership role and actually done some serious work. I mean, this is outrageous. 23 men that we know of and more like most likely more were murdered over the course of a decade. And it was not treated as a really high priority case. Um, I just can't understand that. I can't understand it. And the only thing I can put it off to is the fact that there are very vulnerable, very sidelined victims from lower class, from fringe occupations, I, I, w- I guess I would say. And that uh, they were looked at as gay, whether they were gay or not. And I think for all those reasons, especially during this time period, um, that they were not given the voice or the justice that they deserved. Laura? Yeah, I mean, 18 bodies, uh, I really just find that very difficult. Um, 
you know and that I think you know Jim and I both know with with our careers and you know also with the the media there are some cases that attract more attention than others and um, pressure that comes to bear that certain cases get more resources and sadly this is a, a, a prime example albeit the media in this case you know there was no one pressuring no, the families couldn't do it the the media the local journalist actually did do quite a lot in calling up um, the New York Times and trying to get interest in it but but there was none and um, I certainly have shared with with Jim C you know the frustration at times where certain cases are seen as much more of a priority and for the task force you know in 2005 to be set up and them saying yes they understand that they have a problem um but the police would you know are doing a good job um and even for the chief prosecutor to say that this was inverted commas a successful serial killer i'm afraid i, I don't buy into that at all this isn't a success story of uh good linked investigation where proactive lines of inquiry were followed but yet they've got someone who's uh, criminally sophisticated out maneuvering them this is somebody who got away with it for for a long time and actually there were you know as, as jim said and as i've said there are probably far more victims than we will ever truly know about um if you count all of the attempts um as well where he did approach someone or, or different people so you know, I just think when, when I learned about this case, I just couldn't believe it. Trying to get my head round a body count of 23. I mean, that's incredibly unusual in terms of my career experience. And certainly when we were looking at this and then finding out actually this was one of five uh, offenders operating at that time. And that was another reason why the, some of the police said, you know, well, other investigations took precedence. Yeah, they took precedence. Why? But why? why? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's ex exactly what I was going to say, Jim C. Why? How do you make those decisions of when you've got a body count of, of 23 here? I just think it's unconscionable and questions should have been asked about what was going on and who was the top decision maker here saying we're going to you know, allocate resources to the other cases, but not this one. Right. Why would the fact that they chose to go after other killers when this killer was the most prolific killer operating in the area at the time and actually the fifth most most known pro prolific killer of all time in the United States but because he chose to go after what appeared to be poor African American gay men they didn't make it a priority and it's just outrageous that that the fact that they prioritized other cases with which definitely also the victims deserve justice. But when you have a guy who is this prolific, who's killing over and over and over again in these small towns, in these areas that you could really actually make a difference by, by increasing law enforcement manpower, by doing some surveillance, by, by putting in undercover agents, by doing things like actually talking and getting deep histories and victimologies on all these victims, you would find some kind of crossover. And in fact, there was some crossover because all of these guys ran into this one serial killer. And that should have been something they could uncover in an investigation. So and those who more. survived Sorry. all described a very similar person too. And just the basic timeline would have revealed that. That's the frustrating thing with it, that it is unconscionable, get, you know, going back and, and looking at this, that, you know, how many more? And th the right questions just weren't asked at the time. Uh, so we just, we do actually have two more victims that we have not talked about yet. Bruce Williams uh, was the next victim. And from Bruce's picture, it looks like he's lived a pretty tough life uh, at, at 18 years of age. Uh, he he probably was one of those marginalized citizens who didn't have much going on, and uh, and this particular serial killer took advantage of his vulnerabilities. Um, but he was an African American male who who barely made it into adulthood before he was taken advantage of and and raped and brutally murdered. And the last victim that we know of um, is Christopher Sutterfield. Happens to be another white victim. Uh, again, a change in MO, 
a change in victim selection criterion or simply convenience because Christopher was available and vulnerable, but not within his the demographic that this offender would typically choose. I believe he was 27 years old. He would become the last victim, not because the serial killer decided to stop, but because another would-be victim, Rick Wallace, came forward and identified the person, R.D., as someone who had attempted to rape him. And he also gave a very detailed description of how the approach was made, the ruse that was used, and that would then explain a number of the circumstances that we would find in all the previous cases or many of the previous cases. Up next, we're going to talk about Ricky Wallace and how R.D. was finally caught. In 2005, that's when Hurricane Katrina hit here, and it kind of pushed us back a good six months on working the case. And you just didn't know when the next body was going to pop up somewhere. You know, I still think there were there were probably, you know, scores of victims that nobody's ever heard from who had interactions with R.D., some of whom we do know about, like Ricky Wallace, who successfully got away from him, uh, Aka Motormouth, who led to him actually being arrested. But I would imagine that there's scores of other people who interacted with him and did get away with it. And for whatever reason, RD didn't go ahead with that offence. So he's got a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of practice in inverted commas under his belt of what he's doing and reading people. And he's been getting away with it for a very long time. But it certainly wasn't due to his criminal sophistication, um, which is what some, some I think, law enforcement would, would have us believe, that it's, it was down to the fact that he was criminally sophisticated, no, that no. <laughs> they weren't able to arrest him, which I'm sorry, but I just do not buy into that at all. But, you know, this guy wasn't brought to justice because of the, the great task force that was amassed to, to apprehend him. It was from this guy, Ricky Wallace, who actually knew one of the victims and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but shouldn't they have already talked to him before this? I mean, if you're really taking somebody's death seriously and like we've established, you're going through and talking to all their friends and and doing your due diligence. They, they He came to the police. The police didn't come to him. He came to his parole officer to say, hey, this sounds like the same guy who, you know, tried to rape me. It just I mean, did that strike you at all? Yeah, it struck me. Uh but, but the he, point is, there are lots of other victims out there, as Jim and I know, you know, law enforcement weren't going out trying to garner community intelligence, as it were, and asking people to come forward if they'd been approached by somebody or if something had happened. And I think, you know, the, the parole officer playing a key role here, and I think he also knew Nick Pellegrin, who we were just talking about, because I think he was also on probation for for drugs. I think it was something, uh, you know, relatively minor, but smoking marijuana or, or supplying it. But I, I still think there were lots of other people and lots of op- missed opportunities just from basic lines of investigation in all of these cases of who knew whom and sequence of events and where people were last seen and with whom. And probably many of those roads would have led back to R.D. because he wasn't being criminally sophisticated. He wasn't worried about being seen. He was picking up people outside bars or you know, people on their way home. Um, and it seemed as, as he went on, as we know with serial killers, they do become more and more arrogant and reckless. And that's what normally gets them caught. Rick Wallace came forward and said that he was approached by a guy, sort of a short, dumpy, white guy, very meek, uh, who showed him a picture, a Polaroid picture of a woman, and said that this woman wanted to have sex with a black guy, and she would pay him for it, and that R.D. would arrange this, and he brought him back to R.D.'s trailer. He lived in a trailer. And when they got there, R.D. said that, look, he, he just he's very worried about the possibility of getting raped by this guy, by Rick Wallace. And so he said, I'd like to tie up your hands and your ankles, and then I'll bring the woman out. And Rick being uh, extremely uh, street savvy and also a fast talker, 
actually said, no way, no fucking way. That's, I'm not doing that. I don't care who's walking out of that room. I'm not doing it. And he left. He got out of there. Um, he got out of there with his life. And he then later approached law enforcement saying, hey, you know, the things that have been going on around here, that sounds a whole lot like what what almost happened to me. And in fact, he knew one of the victims. Right, he knew Christabel. Right. And so he said to the police, I think you should look at this guy. So they go, the police go, members of the task force go, knock on his door, and this little dumpy um, R.D. opens the door, very meek, very cooperative. They ask him to come downtown, and during the course of that, they take a buccal swab for his DNA. Um, he wanted to be liked by the police officers. He wanted to be helpful, um, and he just simply, um, you know, gave his DNA and then went off on his merry way. Um, of course, uh, it took... I, th I believe it took eight or nine months for that DNA sample to actually be examined. And part of that was because they had other serial killer cases going on. Part of it also was because nobody, you know, the, the, the chief of police, the, the mayor, the parish leaders, the governor, none of them got on the phone and said, damn it, do this case now. None of them were outraged that there were 23 dead people of their constituents, 23 dead citizens, and it languished for nine more months. And did he probably kill other people in that time? Most likely he did, despite the fact that the authorities had brought him in. Because twice before, he had been arrested for aggravated rape, and and he had gotten away with it. So I don't think it, it deterred him at all. If anything, all he did was hide the victims better. But at that point, um, eventually that DNA came back uh, to R.D., and the police went back. And they, they found that he was no longer living in that trailer, that he had been uh, homeless for a little for some time at that point. He was in a homeless shelter. They bought him in. He was very, very, again, meek and mild. And they presented him with the evidence that they got DNA matched to one of these victims. They probably made it seem like they got DNA matched to all the victims. And he eventually opened up and spilled his guts. But here's the dis disgusting part. R.D. presented himself as the victim in almost every one of these cases. And in the early cases, as he described him brutally murdering these, these vulnerable uh, victims after he had made them helpless, um, he would say, I, and then I got scared that they were going to rape me. So I reached for something and hit him over the head. Or I reached for something and strangled them with a the rope. And by the time I realized what was going on, what was happening, not what, what I did, but what was happening, he made it very passive, the person was already dead. And so I panicked and dumped the body. Or so I panicked and raped, raped and killed them. Or so I panicked and strangled them. I mean, it's just absurd, but he said it over and over and over again about all of these 23 victims that he admitted whilst whimpering and crying and, you know, saying that he's not a killer, he's just trying to survive. Well, self-defense, right? Hey, self-defense, self exactly. Time and time and time again. And, you know, took no responsibility for, for any of it. So, you know, I, I think all things considered, you know, he used to be the bingo caller as well. And a lot of the, the old ladies there, the, the elderly ladies who went there, couldn't believe that it was him. And, you know, he did fool a lot of people, but... You know, as we know, through uh, behavior and certainly behavior that's need driven in this respect, him, him claiming victimhood the whole time, um, you know, is just outrageous. And yes, he's a, a pathetic individual, but actually a very dangerous one because he was allowed to get away with it over and over and over again. And in fact, the, the last case, I think it was um Chris Sutterfield, that last case in particular, he was killed 11 days before the DNA came back. So, you know, huge opportunities across this whole timeline to intervene and to identify him and to take him out of circulation because he was a, a, a high risk to, you know, and exploited so many young 
men, um, black and, you know, five of them being white. And he was incredibly manipulative and, and deceptive. Right. And, and this also proves that timeline. I didn't realize it till you just said it, but that timeline also proves that while the police knew that he was the killer and while he was out waiting for that DNA to come back, he definitely killed at least one victim, Chris Sutherfield, Sutterfield, and that is something that absolutely could have been prevented. Why was he not being watched? Why did they not take the biggest serial killer case at that time in the history and the biggest serial case in the history of the state of Louisiana? Why didn't they take it seriously enough to watch this guy and prevent him from killing somebody else? It's Please. just... Asinine. Legally, could they have held him based on the eyewitness account from Ricky Wallace? They should have been able to charge him with that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, be, when you, first of all, this guy twice before has been arrested for that same stuff, for raping or attempting to rape, for raping and attempting to rape others. The only thing that they gained was possibly the ability to do a non-custodial um or a non-confrontational interrogation of him uh, once they did formally get the DNA back. They didn't want, probably didn't want to take the chance, but they should have, at the very least, surveilled him. They sh- it, it, it had to be easy to, to right. watch this guy. I mean, he's, you know, he's not easily lost. He's not a really sophisticated guy. And, you know, he went out trolling. So, you know, from 2005 onwards, when they formed that task force, there was so much more proactively that they could have done, as you said. And they would have caught him out and about as the predatory stalker that he was. And I find it really interesting that in the, the task force sold themselves as a success. And, you know, their quote was that everybody worked together to bring this to a successful conclusion. Successful conclusion after more and more and more of these young men were killed, brutally murdered, and raped. It's horrible. I'd be disgusted by that. This still is a case, and I remember when we covered it in Killer Profile, the show, together, Laura, that I remember this being incredibly disturbing just because of the opportunities they had, him in custody over and over again, and the fact that there were all these crossovers that they could have discovered and they didn't. That led to another victim and another victim and yet another victim up until at least 23 of them were murdered before they finally were able to arrest them. And it's not just linkage blind, you know, being completely blind to those links. It's just pure apathy, lack, lack of interest, which is just unconscionable. Well, fortunately, he was convicted. But I just want to say that um, Nick Pellegrin's family you know, they were very bitter about the fact that they had wanted the DA to seek the death penalty. And, you know, again, the victim's families were kind of all lumped together as one big entity. And, you know, the DA would say, oh, well, the families, they all want this. And so, you know, once again, no, they weren't listened to and they, they really wanted to have um, R.D. Te- you know, testify and speak because they wanted to hear his reasons for the things that he did, and and I don't. It just seems like, especially in the documentary "By You Serial Killer," that the different families wanted different things, and once again, they were all looped together and smooshed together into one thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I t- to tell you the truth, I don't think that they would have found any uh, solace in yeah. what what this asshole would have said because. He definitely was blaming the victims. He definitely was claiming that he was, he was in fact the victim, drawing on pity. He pretended to have, you know, to have inability to even walk and and uh, all this crap. I mean, just total 100% bullshit and really pissed me off uh, how he was able, how he's allowed to do that. But, but if you look at it, if we actually do the profile of this guy, he clearly used rationalizations and projections and, and, and victim blaming. Um, he, he felt sorry for himself and he played the victim the entire time, yet he was, he was sadistic. And these crimes were absolutely premeditated, first-degree murder. He was a serial killer who killed men, boys, gay, straight, um, you know, sex workers, poor people, the list goes on. 
he disposed of them in a way that that showed that he despised them. He he treated them like trash. But that is an expression of how he felt about himself. He had low self esteem. He 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 was the kind of serial killer who was self loathing. Um, but yet he he used that. He used the fact that he was picked on. He used that to to present a non threatening. Um, persona physically and and emotionally and and he yet he still managed to have a hammer and ligatures available you know every time he every said he every time he said well i panicked and this happened and i panicked and that happened no you didn't panic you planned to pretend to panic and then attack and kill these people um but Again, uh, the best thing I can say about this case is that it should teach us all that no matter who the victims are, no matter how marginalized they are, no matter what you think about them, as law enforcement and justice professionals, every victim should be treated the same. Every victim should be given the same weight. And it shouldn't just be the wealthy or the white or the privileged that actually get the attention of law enforcement or the media. And so here at Real Crime Profile, we're glad we had an opportunity here to give these victims their voice back. And we would love to hear from our listeners if you could give us more information uh, through our websites or Twitter in order to get these victims their voice again. I agree with with everything you've said, and I think our last thoughts really should go to the to the victims and the families and those who endured such a, a terrible period where their loved ones were were killed and they had no answers for such a long time. And you know, I, I just can't begin to imagine how that must have felt. And you know, certainly for those that we know little about, we would absolutely um, you know like to learn more. So. I think it's just a a travesty in terms of a case that just should never have been. There were just so many opportunities to intervene and prevent and to have identified him far earlier on. So that's uh, with that, that's our first case of the Killing Bayou series. And next time we're going to tackle another case. So just one recommendation from me this week, which is for, it was actually a book called Apple Tree Yard, but um, it's now a BBC drama that's airing in the UK currently, and it's by Louise Doty. And I was actually turned on to her by someone called Elizabeth Haynes, who's a crime analyst from Kent, who's also an author, who wrote a brilliant book called Into the Deepest, sorry, Into the Darkest Corners, along with others. But Apple Tree Yard's brilliant because it really characterizes the horrors of sexual violence and also of stalking. So uh, I think it's really well acted too. I'm sure, Lisa, you would have something to say about the casting in it. Um, I don't think it's on, it's certainly not on Netflix yet, but um, I know those in the UK can watch it on the BBC and, and on Catch Up. And I think it's really uh, well done in terms of the nuanced uh, aspects of certainly sexual violence and stalking in particular. Jim C., have you got a recommendation this week? Well, I think uh, I would like to recommend the second book in uh, the series written by Merle Temple, um, and that is A Rented World. And it is a follow-up to A Ghostly Shade of Pale, which was an amazing first book. And I think uh, the rest of his series is is just as amazing. And... uh, and I know that if you enjoyed A Ghostly Shade of Pale, you, in, you will enjoy the further adventures of the same characters in A Rented World. Yeah, I'm going to recommend a show that I just finished watching, a series on Discovery called The Killing Fields. I don't know how to describe this. If it's a reality show or a docu I don't even know what to call it because it's... <laughs> kind if of you, a hybrid? It's kind of a hybrid. And if I were casting something... Fictional, I would definitely cast all these people in it because they're such amazing, indelible characters. You have like the craggy old detective coming out of retirement and and the kind of the young, studly, um, ambitious detective. Anyway, these are real people who uh, really live in Iberville Parish and they are trying to solve the cold case of uh, Eugene Boisfontaine, who um, was killed right around the time that we're talking about, um, of our, you know, the, the current uh, cases that we're 
covering right now. But anyway, it's called The Killing Fields on Discovery. Uh, it's really interesting. And uh, check it out. Signing off on Real Crime Profile. So if you want to help us out on the show, please can you go to wandry.com forward slash survey and complete the little survey about us. And it shouldn't take more than five minutes. You can even do it from your phone. So that's wandry.com forward slash survey. It will take you just a few minutes to complete and it will really help us out giving us some more information about you and why you listen to Real Crime Profile. So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233. If you're a regular listener to the show, you know we have great brands like Blue Apron, Audible and Casper advertising with us and they keep coming back because our listeners really respond to them, which we're really thankful for. Well, if you happen to own a business or manage the advertising buy for one, then you should consider advertising on Real Crime Profile. Podcast advertising is on the rise, and it's one of the most effective ways of reaching consumers on the go today. So please go to Wondery.com slash advertisers. Again, it's Wondery.com slash advertisers and get in touch with us. Thanks.
Jim, say, have you got a recommendation this week? 